I'm Gabriella and welcome to Digital Spies YouTube channel. In this video we are going to go through all of the questions we still have after the end of Wonder Woman 1984. With that in mind, this video will be full of spoilers, so if you haven't seen the film yet, probably steer clear, unless you like um, being spoiled. There are some people who enjoy reading spoilers before they go see a film, or in this case watching them. Um, but if you don't want to be spoiled, you can always go to Digital Spy um, and read our spoiler-free review uh, if you want a little bit of something, but you don't want to really have the film ruined for you. With that in mind, sit back, relax, and enjoy the unanswered questions from Wonder Woman 1984. So I'm just going to dive right into these questions. I assume if you're watching this, you've seen the film, so the questions will make sense because you'll know why we have the questions. If not, uh, I don't know, shit out of luck. My biggest pet peeve is why is it called the Dreamstone? It's a stone that when you touch it, it grants your wishes. When you make a wish, you have one wish and it grants the wishes of the wisher and it's called a dream stone. So that's just my pet peeve. It should be called a wish stone, right? Come on. Okay, anyway. So the real first question we have is what actually happened to the dream stone at the end of the film? So if you remember, um, and this is like maybe kind of answered in the film, but maybe not very clearly. Uh, as I was kind of making this video, I had a light bulb moment of like, oh, actually, maybe I do know the answer to this. But anyway, we'll go into it. Um, so if you remember, Maxwell Lord, played by uh, Pedro Pascal, uh, is holding the Dreamstone and he wishes to become the Dreamstone to have its powers. And the stone disintegrates and he then gets those powers. But by the end of the film, he's renounced that wish. So does the stone like re, I don't wanna say reanimate because it's not alive, we come back together? reassemble. Uh, it's a bit tricky because in the film they do explain that the only way to defeat the stone is for everyone to renounce their wishes but then that doesn't does that mean that the stone would then disintegrate and if so it doesn't really make any sense because the stone doesn't like does the stone have a will of its own and it like wills itself to, to like the ring right like does it Lord of the Rings the ring um, does it will itself toward people like call to them and then they make a wish and then it kind of kickstarts this whole cycle that leads to the end of a civilization or is it just like a rock hanging out and someone's like oh that's a pretty rock and they pick it up and then the end of the world is not really explained well enough for us to know if by the end we still have to worry about this stone like what i don't really know uh yeah, so I was, uh, you know, a little bit confused by that. If you have an answer, if there might be stuff in the comment. I have no idea. Um, let us know. How did Barbara Minerva know that Maxwell Lord was in danger at the White House? It's a bit weird. She, Barbara's character arc, I think, wasn't quite fleshed out well enough for me. I actually really, she was one of my favorite parts of the film. I really love Kristen Wiig and I think she did a great job in the role. Uh, but we don't really know how she ended up doing so much of what she did. So so there's a bit where Pe uh, Pedro Pascal's villain, Maxwell Lord is trying to get, I was gonna call the villain Pedro Pascal, that would not be nice. Uh, Maxwell Lord is trying to get to the president because he wants more, 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 you know. Uh, and the president has stuff. So anyway, he he's trying to get to the president. So he goes to the White House and Diana uses a connection that she has um, from working at the Smithsonian and like being in that circle to also get to the White House to try and stop him from uh, giving the president a wish, but then also taking something in return. They're like juking it out in the hallway. It's quite a cool little fight scene. It's in the trailer. Um, she like lassoes him with her golden lasso. Uh, and then Barbara shows up to save Maxwell Lord. And it, it it didn't even strike me at the time until I was talking about it with somebody else afterward of how did she know he was there? And why, I mean, we know why she wants to protect him. She wants to protect him because she wants to keep her powers that she, you know, she wished to be like Diana. She wants to retain that, um, you know, that sense of coolness and effortlessness and all of that stuff that, that Diana has. So she doesn't want to let that go. But how did she know he was there? Like, is she stalking him? I mean, they do have like kind of a thing at the beginning and obviously for Maxwell Lord, it's just to get to the stone. Um, I just keep thinking of Harry Potter in that scene in the very first film, which I'm not gonna name because the Brits and Americans have very different names for this. Um, 
And and Coral just goes, give me the stone! Uh, you can tell I've been cooped up at home too long, because like this is the stuff that I'm doing. Anyway, we don't know how Barbara knew he was at the White House. Maybe it was just a really good guess. Maybe one of the powers she got was cool, good intuition. Maybe. We don't know. We just don't know. So this is sort of a, another kind of bonusy question. Uh, I had this question after seeing it. Um, one of our other Digital Spy teammates remembered seeing a scene, and then I spoke to another friend from a different publication who didn't remember seeing it. So we're all a little confused as to whether this actually happened or not. There may have been like a collective blackout with me and some of my other people that I know, and then not for others. Essentially the question is, when did Diana change into the Golden Eagle armor? So. If you remember throughout the film, she there's a point where she sh Steve finds the armor kind of wrapped up in Diana's little uh, kind of like surveillance room, which is very 1984. Um, and he asks her what it is, and she tells him the story. But it's obvious that you know it's it's not it's not being worn. It's there. It's kind of like kept like an artifact, like most of this film deals with. Um, however. Before she goes to the military base where Maxwell Lord is trying to get into the satellite thing, um, at some point she she changes into that costume. And all I remember is Maxwell Lord tapping into that satellite with the particles that touch everybody and that's how he touches them. Because one of the things is you have to touch the, uh, I don't know. I feel like we need a physicist to explain how like particle transmitting through satellites works. I certainly don't understand it. So I can't explain that bit to you. Um, anyway, he's there with Cheetah, AKA Barbara Minerva, and everyone is wishing for nukes and for their spouses to die. It's very bleak. I like to think that some people would just be like, you know, I want, a, I want a cat. I feel like that's a nice wish, right? Anyway, so we're watching all this like chaos uh, erupt from people making all these wishes, right? And then Diana is, you know, riding through the, through the sky and stuff and the lightning. And then all I remember is her landing at the kind of cliffside edge where this military base is in the Golden Eagle armor. I, that's all I remember. Now, my coworker, uh, remembers there being a kind of like a quick cutscene where she goes back to her house and gets the armor. And then another person I spoke to didn't remember that. So if you remember it, if you saw it, let me know. Comments. Um, once it's out on HBO Max in the States, that's going to be a really easy way to check because like you can go back and you can watch really carefully and pause it. But right now, you know, I'm in the UK, so I did not have that luxury. Okay, so this one is kind of a two-parter. Um, the first part of that is what happened to Cheetah at the end of the film. Uh, so this, for me, was a bit weird. It was all a bit weird. All these questions, I mean, not the whole film. Uh, so one of the kind of main cruxes of Barbara as a character is, is she's coming from a place of envy, but also a place of... Um, she feels invisible, you know, and I've one of those things that one of the things that I like most about that character is it was quite a, a relatable motivation is that she sees this woman that she both envies but wants to be like but also like just wants to be around. It's it's one of those kind of complicated dynamics between friends um, and not exclusively women, even though I think it's often played that way. I think that exists regardless of where you fall. Um, on the kind of gender spectrum. I think you all have those people that you you look up to but also kind of want to dislike because they have something you don't, right? And it doesn't have to be a thing materially. It's just a vibe or an energy or a presence, right? And I think that's really what Barbara is carrying with her. Um, a caveat question to this is Maxwell decides that she deserves a second wish, which I, I guess because he is now the Dreamstone, he can do that. Uh, and she wishes to be an apex predator who like, I know that she wants to be like powerful and maybe one of the things that the stone took away from her was like sanity. I don't know. It's just like, or uh, I shouldn't say sanity. I don't like using that. Um, maybe it took common sense. Oh, that's another one I don't really like. Anyway, whatever it took from her, who the hell wants to be an apex predator? It's just a, such an odd, she doesn't say I want to be the best or the strongest or the fastest or totally unique 
which is sort of what she's getting for. She wants to be like the best of the best of whatever she is. But an apex predator is such a specific um, choice of words. And obviously they needed her to say that because she has to become a cheetah. Anyway, that's the caveat question is why'd she get a second wish and why'd she pick apex predator? Um, anyway, she obviously really, 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 really wants to hold on to these powers. Um, so at the end, the last we see of her, she has her fight with Diana and Diana defeats her and kind of leads her body out there, her little cat's costume body. Mm -hmm. uh, and then she goes off to fight Maxwell Lord. The next time we see her, she looks like herself again. She isn't in that weird CGI furry cat's flashback outfit. Um, and she's kind of like looking out over the horizon. But the, the reason that everyone renounced their wishes or the kind of um, impetus to do that was that Diana interrupted Maxwell Lord's broadcast, right? And she spoke to all the people all over the world who all apparently understand English uh, to get them to renounce their wishes, stop being selfish jerks. You don't need, you don't really want your wife to die. Uh, and so everyone renounces their wishes and, and everything's fine. But, but Cheetah doesn't hear that unless she's got really good hearing and she can hear inside the base with all the crazy noise and the wind that was going on she was just sitting there and maybe it was like the near-death experience and she was like actually maybe this is like a little much and i don't really want to be a cat woman uh but it just it just didn't quite work for me i wanted to know more of how that came about um and then also what happens like she's she's unequivocally by the end a bad person she's a villain in the film like is there no repercussion for for her actions she's just there are we gonna see her again we don't know we have no idea and it feels weird to leave such a big unanswered question about one of the kind of three main characters or four main characters in this film with that in mind the next question is what happened to maxwell lord at the end of the film in the same vein we know why he renounces his wish right he all the world leaders have wished for nukes because let's be honest they would um and uh his son escapes from the office or like leaves the office um because it's just a mob scene and there's people trying to break in it's all a bit crazy um and he runs out onto the street and he's calling for his dad um, and he wishes that his dad would be with him but i guess Maxwell gets to pick what wishes he wants to grant and he doesn't grant that one because it's not like he suddenly disappears and reappears on the street. He chooses to, um, he renounces his wishes to kind of get rid of the nukes because when he renounces his, I guess it's kind of like a knock-on effect as well that all the other ones are renounced to. Or no, he's the last one. Oh, that's what it was. See, I'm remembering as I'm saying this. Everyone else has renounced their wishes, including all the world leaders who wished for nukes, but um, the nukes are still in the sky and, and the kids running around and, and he can hear his son calling his name or calling out for his father. And so Max renounces his wishes and very quickly runs from the satellite area thingy on the mountainside into the, the streets. There's a lot of questionable geography in this. Um, if there's any geographers out there, uh, and finds his son and hugs him. And it's a quite, actually it was quite a tender moment. Um, and they share a very emotional scene and you get a little flashback of Maxwell Lord, which was neither here nor there, but the moment with them was very sweet. Um, and then that's it. Now this guy literally nearly destroyed the world. And yet we don't know where he went, what happened, was he arrested? Is he in some military prison? Did he run away with his son? There's no answer to that. And if the film had ended right there, we almost wouldn't have had those questions, but the, it doesn't. The film jumps forward six months and the very last bit of the film, not including the post credit scene, takes place approximately six months later, which leads us to our next question, which is... Does nobody actually remember that the world nearly ended six months ago? I feel like that was a big deal, right? Like all the major... Um, world powers had nuclear weapons and had fired them and there was chaos and looting and rioting and and presumably people there were people dropping dead i mean like it was chaos and we saw it, it was chaos um and yet six months later it's like christmas market and everyone is hanging out and is fine and that to me was a bit weird and and not that we don't have short memories because we do as as so many of the um 
how do I put this delicately? So many of the political scandals that are swept under the rug or quickly moved on from have taught us that people uh, move on very fast. This seems like quite a big thing, right? As a parallel, obviously we're living in kind of like the COVID times. I don't, once everyone is vaccinated, right? And we kind of get back to some semblance of normal. I still think six months from then, from that point, people will be like, wow, man, like I'm feeling a little traumatized or I'm feeling really sad or, you know, my loved one died. I mean, like there's so many knock on things that happen from these giant traumatic moments. And this was like near nuclear apocalypse and everyone is just fine. You know, it's snowing in DC. Uh, everyone's hanging out. Ah, oh, winter. I bet that, I, w I would expect, I would expect some lingering stress from that situation. I feel lingering stress from this situation. Ay. Will Steve Trevor return? Uh, our gut says no. Chris Pine has said himself no. He doesn't think, he thinks Steve is done now with the franchise. Um, but that being said, he does come back in the comics after death a few times. So there's no reason to say he won't come back again. Uh, how to make it work in the film, which isn't, the films aren't based um, on comic book storylines, right? So the way that Steve is resurrected for this film is organic to the film. Um, and it, I actually quite liked that. I thought it was a, the way that they did it was really clever. Um, and it was important to the plot. It, it, it didn't feel like a shameless kind of like a money grab, I guess, or, or draw, like people are only gonna come see it if Chris Pine is in it. Um, it felt organic, it felt natural. Um, but I don't know how they would do that again. Uh, so we think probably not, maybe like a cameo or a flashback. Like, there's always ways you can have the character in, but as a kind of main character, important to the plot, probably not, that's our guess, but we don't know. Um, that's kind of a more a bigger unanswered question. Um, but yeah, it's one that we, you know, we think about when filming. What? What was the whole experience like for Handsome Man? Now, Handsome Man, that's literally how he's credited in the film, is the guy that when Steve is reanimated, or not reanimated, I shouldn't say reanimated, because that makes it sound like his corpse came back to life. It didn't. When Steve is brought back to the world of the living from whatever spiritual realm he found himself in, he takes over the body of this dude, right? This guy named Handsome Man. And uh, what they do in the film is to kind of remind you of that is there's a moment where he's looking in the mirror and he sees the handsome man's face looking back at him. But Diana says, I only see you, which so w the audience is very sweet. The audience buys into the fact that we are seeing him through her eyes. Uh, so we just kind of go along with the fact that we know no one else sees it as a person who looks like Chris Pine, but they see it as this other guy. Um, but now this, the, the events of Wonder Woman 1984 had to unfold over like several weeks, let's say. Um, I actually can't remember. I should look that up and I will. Um, but it unfolded over a lengthy enough period of time where did he not have any like family or friends who were like, why isn't he returning my calls? Where is he gone? Or imagine like DC's, I mean, I've been to DC. I've never lived there, but it doesn't, it, it didn't strike me as a giant city. So presumably you would maybe run into someone and they'd be like, hey, and he would ignore you and it would be really awkward. Like, how is there no, uh, there was just no, <laughs> nothing for him. And then at the end, he runs into Diana in the, in the wintry scene and doesn't recognize her. So was he like blacked out? Did he not wonder why he didn't remember the fact that the world nearly ended or, or when Steve, when Diana ren renounced her wish and Steve went back to the afterlife, presumably, and then did Handsome Man like come back to himself standing there on the street with all this chaos going around? Like what, it just, it needed a little more explanation because I just, let's get a Handsome Man spinoff. Oh my God, that's the answer. Handsome Man spinoff. So those were all of our questions. Hades wants to know when she's gonna feature in the next Wonder Woman. I mean, she's a god after all, so you know, she's gotta gotta get her a little time in Wonder Woman. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Those are all of our questions. If you had any other uh, unanswered questions from Wonder Woman 1984, 
please let us know down in the comments. If you have any answers to the questions, if there's any physicists or geologists or quantum physicists that want to give me an answer on the particles thing, comments below, please. But for now, that's it. If you liked what you saw, you can always like and subscribe to our YouTube channel for more glorious at-home content. But for now, thanks for watching.